From Just the News, Supreme Court orders New York to respond to Missouri lawsuit over Trump lawfare this week. Uh, this seems pretty big. Is this a victory for you guys? Yeah, this is huge. I mean, the Supreme Court is, has taken notice of the lawsuit we filed against the state of New York. And again, you've got a, a rogue prosecutor and collusive judiciary in New York who have uh, prosecuted uh, Donald Trump under specious legal grounds. The, the, the prosecution is replete with constitutional procedural error. Uh, ethics violations should have never happened. I've never seen such a gross miscarriage of justice, but that's what you get in New York. And uh, at the end of the day, that hurts Missourians and every other state because we have a right to participate in a national presidential election on equal footing with every other sovereign state. And Missourians are being denied access to and being denied the ability to hear from a presidential candidate in the heat of a campaign in the most consequential national election in this in this country's history. And so that harms Missourians. So you you filed, uh, uh, I should say, on behalf of the state of Missouri, you sued New York, its original jurisdiction. So the Supreme Court is the court that hears it. We, we announced the news when it broke, yeah. and many people said, but wait, Supreme Court's out of session. How does this work? Yeah, d different dockets. So you've got kind of the uh, Supreme Court's appellate review docket, and that's what mostly the Supreme Court does, is review cases that have been adjudicated at a lower court. But the Founding Fathers contemplated there would be disputes amongst the states, and they codified a method by which we could redress those grievances in Article Three, Section 2 of the United States Constitution. And it's the original action docket. And so that's separate and apart from kind of their appellate review. And so uh, other states have sued other states before. Typically, it's about like water rights or, or yeah. boundaries. This is different because, again, we're suing uh, the state of New York for hijacking this election and, and injecting poison into our democratic process through lawfare. But uh, it's an original action of the Supreme Court. Uh, we file our pleadings. The court has ordered New York to respond. They have until tomorrow to respond. We'll see what they do. There, there are three claims you're making? That's correct. Yeah. Number one, First Amendment violation. Uh, you know, the, the gag order that the, the court instituted in New York is unconstitutional. It violates President Trump's right to speak, but it violates our right to hear from him. And it, the important point here is like the the gag orders in criminal prosecutions, there's a strong presumption against gag orders because of our First Amendment rights. But that's especially true. And those considerations are heightened when you're talking about a presidential candidate. <laughs> a front but, runner. But, but beyond that, the gag order is supposed to protect a defendant's right to a fair trial. Well, number one, the trial's over. Number two, here the state, the prosecutor got the gag order. If Donald Trump wants to put himself at risk by speaking out publicly about the trial. He should be allowed to do that. And we have a right to hear from him. So that's the first claim. The second claim is that, uh, in, again, in Missouri, we had a caucus uh, and there are uh, electors who were selected based on that caucus to attend the convention and cast votes for President Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee. Those electors are being denied access to a presidential candidate because anytime he's spinning in a Manhattan courtroom or potentially in a New York state penitentiary or on probation in New York, he can't be campaigning. And that harms our ability to have access to him. The third claim is uh, under the Purcell Doctrine. So the Purcell Doctrine stands for the proposition that courts should stay out of decisions that would obfuscate or interfere with an election. And again, those considerations are heightened the closer in time you get to an election. And so the same should be true in New York. People are already asking me, constituents reach out all the time. Can Donald Trump be on the ballot? Am I going to get to vote for him? Is he going to get to come to Missouri and talk to us? Uh, can he still serve as president if he's convicted of a felony in New York? So this New York court is, is violating the Purcell doctrine by injecting that kind of level of obfuscation into the electoral process. This is absolutely crazy because it brings up a lot of questions. Now, we know any reasonable person who reviews the criminal charges against Donald Trump in the hush money case would scratch their head and say, What? Yeah. None of this makes sense. And I'll, and I'll break it down because I know there's people who haven't watched every show, but I'll try and make it quick. The charges against Donald Trump are for falsification of business records, but that's a misdemeanor and it's beyond its statute of limitations, meaning they can't bring the charges. What are we talking? Seven years later, they claim it's upgraded to a felony if you uh, falsify business records in furtherance of a secondary crime. Now, they claimed that Donald Trump, the, 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 the judge said to the jury, if you believe Donald Trump committed a secondary crime, it doesn't matter which one, then you, then, then you can find him guilty on this one if you believe he also falsified business records. Now, correct, 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 uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but how do you, as a, how does a court, first of all, upgrade a charge with the presumption of a secondary crime that has never been adjudicated through any kind of due process means or anything. Yeah. The court is just decreeing the crime exists. That's right. And and two problems there from a constitutional standpoint. Number one, lack of notice. 34 count indictment that again refers to, you know, false business entry for this based on another crime. And the, you can read the indictment. It says another crime 34 times, 34 counts. 
that's a notice violation under the due process clause. The president has a right, President Trump has a right to have notice of the alleged offense. So they deprived him of due process in right. that regard. Jury unanimity is the under the Sixth Amendment is the next problem. So when the jury goes back to deliberate and the judge says, hey, pick any old predicate offense you want, you don't have to agree. Under Ramos v. Louisiana case, it was handed down by the United States Supreme Court in 2020. Uh, stands for the proposition that the Sixth Amendment right to a fair trial includes the right to jury unanimity as to every element for which the defendant is charged. Wow. So they violated his constitutional rights to due process, violated his First Amendment right to free speech, violated his uh, Sixth Amendment right to jury unanimity. You look at the fact that the uh, prosecutors were uh, politically motivated because they campaigned on a promise to prosecute President Trump. They should have been disqualified. The judge has deep ties to the Democratic Party, also should have been disqualified. In Missouri, it's an appearance of impropriety standard. Well, here there's actual impropriety it's not an appearance not like, an it, appearance it, at all it, it exists so like they should have been that, uh, that uh, this is reversible error it's an incurable impropriety the, the, when i say that the the case is an illicit witch hunt prosecution that's what we're talking about is all of these problems that typically in a criminal trial maybe you have one problem that results in uh, what could be reversible error but here it's like replete with reversible error isn't this an emergency isn't it this is. something the Supreme Court should take up within yes. hours well, and shut it down? And, and this, that's the point. Everyone's like, look, if President Trump was wrongfully convicted, his appeal will figure that out. That's insufficient. That vehicle for raising these claims is insufficient to adjudicate the grievance that the state of Missouri and the voting public in Missouri has against the state of New York. The individual appeal process will vindicate President Trump individually, but that's going to take 18 to 24 months. And we can't wait because the election is forthcoming. So the Supreme Court said... New York has to respond by tomorrow, which means what exactly? Yeah, we'll see what uh, uh, the Supreme. We'll see what New York files. I mean, they they have a reply to our lawsuit, and they'll either uh, try to convince the court that the lawsuit should not go forward. They could concede that there's a problem. I don't anticipate they would do to, that. To, to clarify, does your your lawsuit does it raise claims to the those due process violations against Donald Trump? Yeah, those are central to. I mean, uh, th that's central to the argument that this is lawfare, not a legitimate criminal prosecution. Uh, you know, again, the, the objective in New York was never to obtain a legally valid conviction. It was always to take President Trump off the campaign trail and silence him. Mm -hmm. And they were effective at doing that. And that harms Missourians and all that's voters. That's absolutely insane at a most basic democratic level that you have 50 participants in an election where each state will cast a ballot and you've got several states that are like, well, our clear choice is Trump, but we'll see what happens. So one 50th of the nation decides we will do whatever we have to to destroy his opportunity to actually run a campaign there. there that is the most obvious and egregious election interference imaginable. Now, if it was something like Donald Trump shot a guy in Fifth Avenue and everybody saw it happen. Well, I don't know what leg you got to stand on. States can bring charges against people if everybody watched and there's a preponderance of evidence. Then you go to trial and he can prove his innocence beyond a reasonable doubt, et cetera, et cetera. But here we're looking at any reasonable person. And, and we saw this with Fareed Zakaria. He said these charges would not have been brought against someone whose name was not Donald Trump. Even yeah. CNN admits it. Yeah. And they've never, th this statute has never been used in New York in the way in which they're using it against President Trump. Uh, two other points I want to make real quick. You know, the, you've also got this problem when you talk about the statute of limitations. Again, that is even more problematic in this instance because the statute that creates the offense for which Donald Trump was charged, I think it's New York Code 175.10, but it allows for an affirmative defense. And when you've got an affirmative defense, that requires the defendant, who typically doesn't have any burden of proof, to, by preponderance of the evidence, establish that he is legally excused from what would otherwise be criminal behavior. The due process violation is worse in this context because how can he take advantage of his statutorily granted affirmative defense and gather evidence to defend himself if he doesn't know what the predicate offense is? Right. <laughs> He just has to kind of prepare for anything like it's a weird pop quiz. Again, the, and that's the due process violation is worse in this instance because of that. Yeah. Absolutely insane. I mean, uh, at, a, at a most fundamental level, we as children learn about the right to confront your accusers. Yeah. Uh, and Trump never for, got for, it, right? For, for what offense was he charged? We don't know. Yeah. Sounds like he's going to get it. Uh, the, the Supreme Court was out of session. And I, yeah. that, I was angered by like, well, come on, guys, it's not summer camp. Like, get to work. But yeah. you said that they somehow were able to legislate from out of session. How does that work? Yeah. So th there's a di again, it's the difference between uh, their, their term in which they review a appeals to the Supreme Court. 
That's a separate docket, and that term has ended. But original actions, are they're never, never out of term when it comes to original actions. Those are always filed directly with the United States Supreme Court. It's a, it's novel. I mean, it doesn't happen too often that states have lawsuits against other states, especially uh, claims like this. But again, it's imperative because of where we are in this election cycle. And so the Supreme Court is absolutely reviewing these cases now as evidenced by the fact that they ordered New York to respond. Uh, did they have to go back to the... And, and to the wherever they work from, or do they do it remote? Yeah, I, I, I believe they could do it remotely. I know that the the, the uh, documents that we file with the court are all printed on pa- paper and distributed to the justices. So, look, the justices and their clerks are aware of the lawsuit. They're reviewing the lawsuit. They, they've issued orders in the lawsuit. This process is is moving forward, and, and again, we we anticipate that uh, we we need to act quickly, and we anticipate the court will act. So, what what argument could New York possibly have? I mean, they're, they're, what are they going to? What could they possibly say to the Supreme Court? Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what arguments they raise. I mean, they could defend the legitimacy of the prosecution, and then we get to again respond with all of these constitutional and, and ethical. But even problems. when wait, 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 it was wait, coming wait. out, there were there were all kinds of people already, all media commenters on the left, saying like, "Oh no, Trump's definitely going to appeal this. Like, this was sketchy. This was not yeah. right." But but it, so there's a possibility that within a week, the Supreme Court just obliterates the whole New York hush money case? They just say outright, we nullify it or what? Yeah, I think the, the prayer for relief here, first of all, yes, these cases need to go away. All of the lawfare against President Trump needs to be, those cases need to be dismissed or uh, judgment entered notwithstanding the verdicts. And we've moved, as the state of Missouri, we filed a brief in the New York case demanding that the judge dismiss the indictment and, and vacate the, the judgment. The Supreme Court, have they already uh, ruled on standing? Uh, they have not yet. So again, th- th- this, these are arguments. They that could they could come out next week and say Missouri has no right to sue New York. They could. I I kind of feel like that's what to do because you've got Thomas and Alito and the rest are sit on their hands types. Yeah, and and you know I think it's time we have an open and honest conversation in this country about standing. It's a jurisprudential concern, and under Article Three, the the federal courts are limited to hearing cases and controversies between parties. You got to show a a a concrete harm from a you know direct action of the defendant. I get all that. Those are important for individual cases. However, when you have states bringing claims, is it time to 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 review our standing analysis and for that analysis to evolve? in a way that gives more latitude to, to allow for states to, to raise claims on behalf of the people. This, of the this was the uh, uh, Texas v. Pennsylvania back in 2020. The Supreme yep. Court ruled on standing, I believe, right? Yep. They, it, it, after three days. They told they said yeah. Texas has no right to argue about Pennsylvania's elections. That's right. And and here's the distinction between that case. First of all, that lasted three days. And, yep. and or maybe it was a few more, but I don't think they got to 10 days. And the, the our case against New York, what the case, that, that previous case was asking was for Uh, the Supreme Court to redo an election. And the courts, again, under the Purcell Doctrine, they don't want to get involved in administering elections or reviewing elections or or, uh, having anything to do with that. So that that was a tall order. This is different, and this case has already gone longer and uh, is receiving review. And, you know, honestly, the court may sit on this case and withhold a decision until sentencing because what the New York trial court does could change the whole landscape. And two arguments here. Number one, if the court were to sentence Donald Trump to prison, well, then the Supreme Court might say, okay, now this is way more important to us. <laughs> Number two, you know, and we've made this argument both at, at the Supreme Court and at the trial court level, but after the immunity decision was handed down by the Supreme Court, you can go back and look at some of the evidence that was introduced in the criminal trial in New York and realize that's the fruit of the poisonous tree. Mm. That evidence should have never been used to obtain a criminal conviction because the president was immune from some of that behavior as we all knew, kind of going into that. Right. So the, the New York court clearly raced ahead of SCOTUS to obtain that conviction. But all of those things are playing out. And, and, I, and I think that's why the court has paused and has taken a hard look at this. And sentencing's in September now? That's correct, yeah. And so there, there are things that are that may, could happen at the trial court level that could right. alter the trajectory of the case that's pending at the United States Supreme Court. Thanks for watching this clip from TimCast IRL. Make sure to check out the live show Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. on this channel. Subscribe and we'll see you all there.